more than a decade and have startups to build various text and data analytics projects and also distributed and scalable systems. He has been working with PostgreSQL, MongoDB, Reddit, Cassandra, etc. and making them work scalable. So currently he has been uh, working on AI to bring common man and scaling millions of users on this app. So today's today's talk will be more interesting at promising on a cost basis also rather than just uh, scalability. So let's hear it from Srinivasan. Thanks, guys. So yeah, my talk is about uh, how you can deploy your Python backend at a very cheap uh, price. So with almost zero cost, if uh, you have uh, a few millions of uh, users. So I am Srinivasan. I work at a company called Matt Street Den. It's a AI-based company. And uh, we build products for uh, fashion and e-commerce vertical right now. So we're concentrating on the fashion and e-commerce. So we have uh, a lot of products that come, that go into your uh, e-commerce websites, the product page, the listing page, all those things. So uh, we, the thing is I will come to a piece of code which, uh, so which shows how we handle that. So previously there were just physical servers, right? And uh, it would take a few days to provision those. So long ago, when you wanted to provision you uh, a server, you choose from a list of uh, pre-configured servers and it would take a couple of days to maximum, a, even a week to provision it. And it would be hard to administer because you need to configure your system, set up the firewalls, everything. And one basic uh, problem is it would be heavily underutilized. So I've seen servers which were like 95% of the time at zero load. And uh, you, you would be paying for the entire month for that server and it's not that easy to, uh, uh, like uh, your entire uh, money is going down the drain, right? So then Amazon and a lot of other companies came up with cloud servers. So it just takes a few minutes, uh, sometimes even few seconds to provision a complete virtual server. And if, if you, you can even create new servers using APIs. That's one great advantage and you can so programmatically create your servers, right? So you can scale up and scale down dynamically. All those things are great. And they are all priced per hour basis and Google has come up with per minute basis too. But um, Amazon seems like they also found out that a lot of uh, EC2 servers or uh, virtual servers are still underutilized. So they came up with something called as Lambda functions. So it takes milliseconds to provision. That's like amazingly fast. Uh, when compared to physical or uh, virtual servers. And it gets 100% utilization. How? So all your code that gets to be, that needs to be executed uh, lives just at the context of your execution. So whenever a trigger happens, your code uh, begins to live, it does its job, dies, that's it. And you pay only for that particular amount, the, of that particular duration that your code has been running. So this is a really great way to uh, scale uh, your backend and uh, it's, it saves cost dramatically. So how people do it? Easy. Step one, create your Lambda function. Step two, you specify which AWS resource that needs to be, uh, that needs to trigger the function and prop it. So triggers, right? So there are multiple triggers that you can uh, uh, use. Uh, for example, let's say someone uploads a file to S3 or let's say some uh, message gets pu pushed to uh, SQS, which is Amazon's uh, queuing system or uh, say SNS, which is Amazon's notification system and uh, let's say uh, some update or an insert happens into DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL system. So these are all Amazon related uh, uh, products which can trigger this event. Another one that I am particularly I am going to concentrate today is HTTP request, plain old HTTP. So whenever someone hits a URL in your system, your Lambda needs to run. And it needs to do something useful. 
and it will return back a JSON response. That's what we are going to see today. So uh, a basic Lambda function, uh, this shows that uh, you have a basic Python class, which is a handler, which takes an event and a context. And I just create a message uh, string, and I return back a dictionary. So events, right? So there are two parameters that this handler takes, event and a context. So event is usually a dict. So if you see in this case, uh, I have event of first name and event of last name, which uh, says that uh, the event is dictionary which, which has first name and last name as keys, and I just need to substitute the values. So it can also be list, string, float, uh, the basic uh, data types that Python supports, right? So, but mostly I've seen all events to be uh, dictionaries. And context is the, uh, is of data type uh, lambda context object. So it uh, shows uh, what the execution context, uh, the information about the execution context. So for example, how much time uh, this function has been alive? How much time still it has for termination? and how much memory is it using, how much memory has it been allocated, and a lot of other information that uh, is needed during the runtime of the function. So the way to deploy it is you create a directory, put your all your py files in it, and you install the dependencies. Um, the way to install dependencies is using a pip install method name, and you specify a target, which is your directory and zip the file, upload it to console, uh, AWS console and so on. But this is too painful and uh, Amazon came up with a uh, experimental project called as Chalice. So this is heavily inspired from Flask, a microwave framework that most of you would have heard. So Chalice does uh, all this uh, steps of uh, creating your uh, uh, um, Lambda functions deploying it to uh, to deploying it to server making sure a http endpoint is created for that and it is pointed to the correct uh, version and so on so it's uh, really easy to do a chalice uh, installation so uh, you just do pip install chalice the way you do all your python code and uh, chalice has multiple subcommands but uh, the one we are going to see is chalice new product uh, new project and you specify the project name in this case it's hello world and if you go into the folder there is just a single app.py file and if you look at the uh, the contents of the file it look very similar to a flask uh, project so i just import from chalice i create a chalice object with the app name so i have multiple functions in this so one is the index, which is at the root uh, slash, uh, and uh, the other one is the root uh, city slash city, and that curly braces city is what will be uh, sent into the function name. So this uh, function takes in a parameter called city, and the API will automatically send that uh, city to this. So both functions return back a JSON. The first case, it is just a plain uh, constant hello world string, right? And the second one returns back whatever the user has given in the URL. So this can be easily deployed. So ins once inside your chalice folder, you say chalice deploy, and it creates all the API gateways, all the endpoints for your HTTP REST APIs, and it gives back a randomized uh, URL. So, uh, Right now it is uh, a dev uh, endpoint, and in a config file you can easily change it to a production endpoint. So you can also have uh, subdomains pointing to uh, this URL, so you can have better URL, uh, better uh, host name, right? So that is how it is. So I have deployed the same code that I had before into this, and these are the two URLs that are available. So one ends with slash dev, and another ends with slash dev slash city slash Delhi. So if you want to uh, easily type it, I have a shortened form here. So if, if you can even go now, if you're logged into your system, you can go to these two URLs and you'll be able to see the JSON response. And the beauty is it gets triggered as soon as you hit your browser go. 
and the lambda function gets executed and once it has returned back the JSON, it ceases to exist. And it, let's say it takes about, uh, say, 200 or 300 milliseconds to send this data back to you. You only pay for that amount. And I'll come to the pricing all uh, pricing page later, but the, this is a really cool way where you can uh, spawn off multiple, uh, uh, multiple code servers which run parallelly and uh, users can hit that uh, concurrently and you, get, you don't have to worry about scaling, you don't have to uh, have failover, all those things are taken care of by Amazon. So uh, just like any web framework, you also need to identify, you also need to get all the uh, things that a user sent in a request object, right? So um, Charles also gives you something called as a current underscore request object and which has multiple dictionaries. So for example, query parents are what you would get in a get request, the what things that are after a question mark. So that is the query params. Then headers are what uh, headers that were sent can uh, have authentication details, all those things. Then URI params are what uh, was sent in slash city slash, right? So that the thing that was sent here, slash Delhi, that is a URI param. And the method is, uh, is mostly post or get. If you are doing it from a HTML form, it could also be put or delete on all the basic HTML methods. And the JSON body is what, uh, whenever a U, uh, form does a post submit, the JSON body contains the dictionary of all the key values that were sent. So if you want, I can, uh, I can uh, go through all the examples that uh, 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 for you. So one example is uh, updating product metadata. So I'll give you some context to, about this, right? So uh, basic product that we do for all customers is uh, basic recommendation engine. So given a product, we need to show them a recommendation of similar products. And this has more, in, more to that, right? So products can have uh, extra metadata about it, like the product name, uh, image link, uh, price of it, and sometimes uh, the customers would want us to handle the availability for them. So if there are uh, the product is out of stock, you shouldn't show it to uh, show it in the recommendation. So all this information comes to us in real time from the clients. So previously it was a very uh, cumbersome process where we had cron jobs, all those things, but. This function does that uh, much more simpler and the client can now push data to our system and it gets updated. So what I have here is a Redis instance, so a connection to a Redis. So we use Redis as our data store and cache, so uh, all our product metadata is all stored here also. And I have a route slash product slash PID slash update. And you can do a post to this request and the function, uh, what it does is, it takes the, uh, whatever post, whatever information was posted is ja there in the JSON underscore body. It takes it as the body and the client gives the client ID and the product key is a uh, key that we use to store our Redis uh, key values, right? So the key is formed, of, formed as client colon product ID. It's just a sample thing. So client ID could be uh, three and product ID could be one, two, three. So it'll be three colon one, two, three. I form this uh, product key and I check if the body contains price key and the availability key. If the price is available, I do a Redis dot H set, which uh, uh, if you don't know, so Redis has multiple data structures in it, right? So in a key, I can set field and values. So for the price field, I am setting the actual uh, price that the client sent. So in this case, it'd be uh, say three colon one, two, three comma price as the field name in the hash and price as say 500 rupees or something like that. So that is the price. And if availability is available, then the availability f field will also be set in the hash. So it could be some customers give uh, availability as integers, some give it give us true or false and so on. So it could be, Redis doesn't care about what you put in, it's anyway, it's a string. So I do a headset and then uh, 
uh, return back. So this is, uh, if, uh, since it's deployed as a Lambda, customers can hit multiple uh, times and everything run its, its in its own containerized version. And you just have to, uh, you don't have to worry about scaling, you don't have to make sure your servers are up or uh, uh, all your uh, software is updated or anything like that. So uh, Amazon handles all that and all the uh, HTTP routing, all those things are handled very well. So this is one example. Another example of, uh, this is a very popular example of uh, Lambda. So this is a very uh, popular use case that you would see in blog uh, posts, a lot of blog posts. So given an image, you need to create a thumbnail image. So in this case, I get the image as a uh, base64 uh, string. So I do a base64 decode of the string, and I find the width and the height. So once I get the width and the height, I uh, have I create a command, uh, which is called as, con uh, I use a command called as convert, which is basically image magic. Uh, the good thing about uh, Lambda is uh, there are a few packages that are pre-built into uh, uh, Amazon pre-builds into your Lambda context. So one is Boto3, which is the uh, standard uh, package you use to handle all your AWS uh, resources. Other thing is the image magic, which is used for image manipulation. So for this instance, I am using a very simple thumbnail creation. Uh, I am using convert for very simple thumbnail creation. And I use these parameters, and I use uh, subprocess.popen to send the image, get the thumbnail, and I put it into S3. So I have removed the import statements at the top and the configuration of S3. But this project is available in GitHub. Uh, this is from a, a blog that I found. So I take a S3 bucket, I, use a, I create a file name, and then I put that object into that S3 bucket and I mark it as publicly available, and I return back a JSON with the URL of the S3 uh, endpoint. So this is one, ex one example of how Chalice has been used for uh, creating thumbnails. And people use this for uh, uh, creating thumbnails, transcoding videos, and a lot of other stuff. So uh, this is about Chalice, right? So there are other use cases about AWS Lambdas. You are not just uh, limited to uh, HTTP only. So other use cases could be like uh, data pipeline. So uh, let's say uh, our customers give us lots of even data, millions of data per day, and uh, we need to process them, uh, find uh, some useful information out of that. And the first step to data processing is always data cleansing, right? So whenever, uh, let's say, a log file comes uh, and uh, Amazon has CloudWatch, which puts your log files into S3 buckets. You can set a trigger for S3 bucket. So whenever a uh, file gets created or updated in uh, uh, S3 bucket at a particular directory, it will automatically it can automatically call a Lambda function, and it will uh, run uh, all your data cleansing uh, algorithms and everything. So this is one uh, major use case that uh, people have been using it. Another thing is, let's say you have a static blog, right? Uh, and people use uh, Discuss as the standard uh, commenting system. And if you want to build your own commenting system, and you don't want to spend a lot of uh, money for servers, even if it is like, uh, let's say you go uh, get a DigitalOcean server or something, you'll be paying $5 minimum for a VPS. So your server would be uh, unless you are like a very high profile blogger, there won't be a lot of comments. And why would you wait, wa waste $5 uh, every month if you are not getting that much traffic and that much comment uh, inflow? So you can easily write your own commenting system which takes in, um, which has maybe two functions. One is uh, post, which uh, does the actual comment posting. Another one is a list of all comments. So this will, uh, all you have to do is uh, use HTTP gateway to handle the uh, URL routing, and you can store your comments in something called as a DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL uh, equivalent in uh, Amazon. So for this, you basically ha don't have to pay anything. Uh, it's uh, practically free. And uh, 
one interesting project that I found was uh, someone did uh, uh, genome searching and editing uh, and ported it into uh, Lambda. So previously you had multiple servers and you had to do uh, a, s a particular, let's say, string sub-search, right? In about three billion, uh, uh, some, some really big file. And he has a very uh, quick uh, algorithm to do this, and he can return it in a few seconds. But he was spending like thousands of dollars every month to handle about hundreds of thousands of users. And this was, uh, this was very easily ported into Lambda, where he put all the searchable uh, genome data into an S3 bucket, and he had a HTTP endpoint, which whenever he wanted to do a search for a particular, say, substring, uh, he had multiple Lambdas running, which downloaded part of each, uh, uh, part of a single file, and it will do the same search across multiple uh, parts of the file and it will collate the results back into uh, uh, back to the user as a result. So this was a, a very clever use of um, using S3 and Lambda and uh, this reduced its cost about $60 per month. So this is a very uh, clear advantage that you get with Lambdas. So there was another project that is found which uh, does continuous integration. People would normally use Jenkins or uh, uh, things like that, right? So you have to have a separate server. You uh, build uh, on the on that server, and it'll always be there. But if you use uh, this, all you have to do is whenever a git push is done, GitHub does a, on a post receive it sends a hook to this Lambda URL, and it runs all the tests. It builds your uh, software, and it deploys it too. So this is a uh, uh, this is very popular. Uh, uh, this was very popular a few months back in Hacker News, and it's called as LAMCI. You can go to github.com slash LAMCI. So it supports a lot of these languages, even though uh, AWS Lambda by default supports Java, Python, and Node.js. Uh, there are hacks where you can even compile Go, Rust, or PHP, Ruby. All these languages are supported. Uh, not by Amazon, but there are hacks to get that. So you can, LAMCI builds your project. If it is in these languages, you can build your uh, uh, project and you can deploy it uh, immediately as soon as uh, git push is done. And uh, it depends on your, uh, uh, like uh, how many git pushes that you do per day, right? So if it is on the order of few tens or hundreds, you would be paying just for the time that it was run. So another uh, use case that is very interesting is, uh, let's say, chatbots, right? Uh, it's very popular nowadays to create chatbots, and chatbots are naturally based on a trigger. And uh, let's say you have a, you want to create a Slack bot. Uh, whenever a user types slash bot uh, do something, it hits this HTTP API, and it will uh, trigger that lambda and uh, does the calculation, does whatever computation that you want, whatever AI logic that you want, and it returns back a JSON, and it's immediately uh, sent back to the user. But lambdas are stateless, right? So you you have to maintain the state yourself. Uh, one request and the second request uh, has no correlation with each other, and you need to maintain uh, either uh, through, uh, say, say, you maintain your session on some readers or something, but uh, that's how you have to uh, maintain your sessions. And whenever a call comes in, you need to send the user ID or maybe the client ID like I showed the demo, right? So this is how you have to handle the state yourself. And uh, so let's come to the limitations, right? It's not uh, great every, uh, like, Everything that Amazon gives doesn't is, doesn't have all the bells and whistles. So the limitations are it can only run for 300 seconds. So it has been designed to run for only five minutes, and after that, whether your function has returned or not, it is going to be terminated. So if your function takes a long time to return or is going to be uh, very complex and uh, is going to take hours, Lambda is not the 
way you need to go. And maximum you can get about 1.5 GB of RAM only. The minimum is 128 MB, 128 MB, 256, 512, and so on. So the maximum you get is 1.5 GB, and if your data set you need to load itself is more than 1.5 gig, you can't use a Lambda. And that the way you can handle that is if you can split your, like I said in the genome uh, editing project, so if you can split your S3 uh, a, a file into multiple chunks and operate on that, then it's a good way. And you get a temp space of about 5 to MB only. Anything that you download from S3 or from some remote uh, host, it needs to fit into 5 to MB. Anything more than that, you can't do. And your request or response needs to be within 6 MB. You can gzip it and send, but 6 MB is the maximum that you can send. You can't send back streaming data. Yeah. Uh, I think it's more like Amazon doesn't want to support because they don't want, this is all running on idle hardware, right? So they don't want some Lambda function to take a long time to complete and it could affect someone else's uh, EC2 instance or something. So that I think that would be the, that was the case that these limitations are put in. But this might change in the future and uh, one limitation is by default your Amazon account has only, you can run 100 concurrent Lambda functions. And I know that is limiting, but you can easily, uh, Amazon's all services are limiting. And uh, like, for example, your EC2 instances are all limited to about 220 uh, or um, uh, some number. So, uh, but you can raise a request and within half an hour you can get that limit uh, increase. So that's not a problem. Uh, one, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, what's the startup latency for this Lambda? I mean, let's say, uh, I understand that the computation which it's supposed to perform is very small, but how much time does, it, it has to spawn a process for it, right? So yeah. is that startup latency a factor? So it's on the order of uh, tens of milliseconds, less than uh, tens of milliseconds. So whenever I saw it has been pretty fast and uh, it's around 10 or 20 max, 20 milliseconds, not, I think more, not more than that. So Thank you. Yeah. And one major uh, thing is uh, it supports only Python 2.7 and uh, but 2.7 is supported to 2020, so you're safe till then. And by the time 3 yeah, will also be. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think ki, uh, Lambda instances are effective. Uh, suppose uh, Google Cloud Engine did the same attempt. Uh, they wrote the classes and decorators, like Chalice uh, did with the rou routes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's doesn't effective. Uh, suppose you have change in functions. So you have to change your routes, basically. Yeah. to call the functions and uh, uh, and Google Cloud Engine uh, of, uh, before 10 years yeah. uh, did, did the same attempt uh -huh. uh, but they failed. So I think the AWS instances are more effective than the Lambda instances in these senses. But uh, one good thing about Lambda is you can have multiple versions running at the same time. So if you have a old uh, version of your API it can also run, and you can have a updated version also but run. I think that if uh, I have to change, uh, suppose uh, build processes are large, uh, there are a large number of changes in functions and API calls and everything. So yeah. I have to change every time the routes, basically. Um, if your build process large, why would you change your route? I don't get it. They suppose there is a large number of changes in functions and uh, class basically in text. Uh -huh. I don't know, but as long as your uh, routes remain, right, uh, I don't see why it should be a problem, but, uh, but for this basic use case, it does work, right? So uh, I don't know what your, what your problem you know, is. Can you rephrase it maybe? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, okay, offline. Yeah. And yeah, these are the limitations, but the advantages are uh, it's automatically scalable because it's all uh, uh, spawned as multiple uh, containers and you can have as many Lambda functions run at the same time as you want, theoretically. And uh, you, you have built-in fault tolerance because if, let's say, Amazon has multiple availability zones in each region. So let's say you have, uh, there are uh, about four availability zones in North Virginia, and you can have one zone com go completely down 
but Amazon has your copy of your function running in all the zones, and it will automatically be switched over to the other zones. But in EC2, if your EC2 instance is running on one particular zone, if that zone goes down, you have to, you, and if you don't have the same instance running on a different zone, then your uh, service is down. So uh, you have to make sure that you have ELBs and uh, your servers running on multiple zones and so on. But with uh, Lambdas, it, it is all automatically taken care of. And automatic admi administration, so you don't have to worry about software updates or uh, package version, all those things. So uh, as long as your package, your zip file is uh, having all the dependencies, it can work uh, flawlessly. And pay per use, right? So I told I will come back to the pricing later. Uh, yeah. Okay, fine. So, so you pay only for the duration that you uh, use, and uh, the chunks are 100 milliseconds chunks. So if your lambda function takes uh, say 70 milliseconds to complete, you would pay for 100 milliseconds, and the price is very very low. So it's about I think six zeros and two zero eight dollars. So uh, this is for a 128 MB RAM uh, function, which a uh, function which takes 128 MB RAM, and for 1.5 gig, it's about uh, uh, ten times more, ten or uh, twelve times more, I think. So this is very cheap, and uh, if you have, uh, say, in a month, you would have uh, thousands of, uh, hundreds of thousands of requests, you would practically fall into the free tier level where you get about 1 million requests free, and you have 400,000 GB uh, seconds per month free. So this is, this is, the, this is not a, a free trial which, spawns, uh, which is uh, just for the uh, 12 months free trial. It, that's not the case. Lambda free uh, tier is for uh, the continuous, uh, even if you're, if you're past the initial 12 months of your account creation, lambda free uh, tier levels are applicable. So that is about uh, the pricing. This is one big advantage that uh, we find uh, whenever we want to move to a Lambda function. So we, uh, a lot of HTTP uh, APIs which uh, doesn't have to be deployed to a separate server or which are very lightweight and can run, run immediately and uh, which are maybe getting something from the cache and returning, right? So these kind of things can easily be done as a Lambda and uh, you can you can save a lot of uh, money if you are uh, a very early stage startup. So that is the advantages of Lambda. So uh, these are the links that I had in the talk. I will be up uploading the slides into my talk page. So uh, these are the links. So the, uh, you can search for AWS Lambda to get the first link. And uh, Chalice has a very nice documentation. And, but it's a very experimental project, so th it is going to be improved a lot. And uh, the thumbnail service, the Lambda continuous integration, and this is the blog post about the genome uh, editing uh, Lambda thing. So uh, this is my GitHub and my Twitter account. And yeah, by the way, uh, if you're interested to join MatchDidn, please email to careers at MatchDidn. Any questions? Yeah, yeah hey. Uh, what I've understood so far is uh, the Lambda is basically more event driven, as in if there is an event, uh, you could have your function, uh, some piece of code that AWS infrastructure will execute yeah. and come back with the result. I'm trying to uh, use it, or I plan to use it for a scenario in one of my projects where it's the reverse that we're trying to do in the sense there's a backup that happens. Let's say there's a master data. We have a database topology. Mm -hmm. Somewhere around the slave, there's a you know, backup slave. Mm -hmm. We have about 600 GB of data that we need to backup every day. Okay. And there are multiple applications, so let's say 600, 500, few of these GBs mm -hmm. uh, you know, instances you have to backup. Now, one day a backup doesn't happen, for example, and I would like to be highlighted rather than you know, monitoring it every day. Mm -hmm. Because this, the database size is ever increasing. Let's say we add a few GBs or 10 GBs every day. Yeah. So I cannot even predict that the backup should happen. I know I can write a cron, and therefore the cron, you know, having done the backup and you know cars use it, blah mm -hmm. blah blah, and we do S3 or whatever I'm missing. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, it's going to 
the timings are going to change. So I really don't want to wait that by this time, you know, the backup should have happened because that's not in my control over a period. Okay. So the point I'm trying to see is if the backup happens, mm -hmm. uh, certainly I can tap that as an event on S3, like you pointed out, yeah. and therefore I can get an email, for example. Yeah. I'm trying to see can there be a reverse that someday if the backup doesn't happen, mm -hmm. uh, I should get alerted. That's it. Uh, so Lambda doesn't work. Uh, you can't do it as a cron. Lambda functions can be done only as an event, but um, I'm just thinking. But mostly AWS has uh, logs which send you alert emails whenever something, some event doesn't happen. If it is, if you're using AWS RDS or Elastic or things like that, it would send you an email if something doesn't happen. But unfortunately, Lambda functions can occur only if an e external event happens. So that is the only way I can think of it. Uh, another, another way you can do this is maybe uh, uh, there are other services which uh, do uh, cron, right? So there are uh, free services which uh, which will send a HTTP POST request to a particular endpoint that you want, and you can use that to trigger Lambda and do that. So it won't be a continuous polling. Um, oh, you want it to be uh, checking every few minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, Lambda is driven by the event that occurred. So it doesn't have a cron kind of thing. So, yeah. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi. So, my question is that uh, you talked about Chalice, right? But it is only limited to the Amazon part. Uh, yeah. What if we want to switch the cloud providers? So it would be a trouble for... Uh, yeah, it uh, would. Right? Uh, so Chalice is an Amazon project itself. So you can use it only for AWS Lambdas. Even though Google has something similar to Lambda functions, you and won't Google be able to use it directly. Guess, yeah. Sorry? Google functions. It is yeah, Google right. functions. So you won't be able to use it directly. But there are, uh, there is, there are ways where you can deploy your Flask or uh, Django project itself into a... Uh, your uh, Amazon uh, Lambda function. So I think uh, same could be applicable on Google functions also. So if you don't want to use Chalice, Chalice is very limiting, right? So there are only uh, basic set of things that you can do and uh, you return back uh, uh, just a JSON only. And you, you don't have templating, you don't have a lot of fancy stuff that goes with Flask. But if you want those things, you can deploy your Flask uh, app itself on uh, Amazon and your code base, your most of your code base wouldn't change, and only the way you deploy it to Amazon or Google Cloud, Google Functions would change. I think that uh, we can also have uh, different frameworks that have been deployed uh, or have been in the build mm -hmm. recently. Uh, I know one that is uh, called Serverless. You okay. can also use that if I'm not wrong. Okay. okay. And uh, one more like doubt. Yeah. Uh, what about monitoring? Because you can't monitor all this stuff. So yeah. that is one very uh, So all the system. logging, any uh, uh, logging is all handled by Amazon. Ha Amazon has its own CloudWatch, which handles all the logging automatically for you. So uh, for example, if you put in a print statement in inside the function, it would be logged into your CloudWatch logs and it will be sent to your S3. So all this is handled by Amazon's other services. So uh, if yeah, you can put your monitoring on the logs and uh, say alert email will come if something comes up. So that's the way you can handle it. So uh, can you talk about a little more on your use case for how you are using this app? Okay. Yeah, so, so this was the the pricing thing, right? So price and availability. What you are using it for? Not this. I mean, you're using Lambda functions for your yeah. project work or, you know, like your... So, yeah, this was the example that I showed, right? So, uh, the product... Uh, so, let's say uh, we have clients who have, like, uh, tens of millions of products, and we store their data in a database, and we cache them all in a Redis instance. And uh, what happens is uh, the price of a particular uh, product can change uh, very frequently. More frequently, the availability will change because as soon as someone buys it, the counter will go down. So all this data, the previously what we used to do is, it will have to go through a cron. Every five minutes we used, we used to do a cron. We pulled their entire catalog, 
uh, or the changes that happen and we used to update it and uh, uh, the database would then reflect it. So there was a minimum gap of five minutes, right? So to avoid this, we can, uh, what we did is decided was we, we will expose an API to the client. So whenever they want to push this availability of price information, those kind of things, what they can do is they just have to call this URL slash product slash uh, the ID slash update and they will send the price, the latest price information or the availability information. So availability could be zero or one or uh, if they send the actual stock, uh, right? So th it could be 100 as a stock. So based on all this, we immediately, uh, this Lambda function, whenever it executes, it will sit in the readers instance. And when we serve recommendation, we uh, check for products which are not in stock, uh, which are in stock only and we had to return only those products as recommendation. So we take, let's say, uh, if the customer is asking for, say, uh, 10 products to be shown in a carousel on their page, what we will do is we take uh, at least 50 products from our index. We make sure that for every product it is in stock. As soon as we get the required number of products, we will return it back to the user. So that is the uh, actual API serving part that doesn't use Lambda still but we are planning to uh, incorporate most of the Lambda functions into pieces like that. But this is what happens in this code, which uh, updates the readers instance of the latest stock information and the latest price information. And this gets, uh, uh, because this is getting displayed on the customer's website directly on the client, and so JavaScript call is what is ma being made here, right? So we need to make sure that we send the right price information. And if the price is wrong and the customer goes to the product and sees that the price is wrong, it he would be pissed, the user would be pissed, right? So we need to make sure that it is updated as soon as the uh, customer uh, sends that information to us. That's why, why we are using it. Sorry? So for Lambda, it is a few uh, hundred thousands of hits. Uh, that's uh, minor only, but uh, it can scale up. Uh, and uh, like I said, the 100 lambda concurrent Lambda functions is a soft limit that Amazon has set. Uh, you can even increase it to a few thousands if you want, and uh, uh, you, you, they would happily run uh, together in the same uh, availability zone. And it's all handled automatically by Amazon. That's, uh, that's a nice part. Hi, uh, great talk. Uh, could you give a crude estimate of how much uh, uh, MSD was able to save on by moving to Lambda? So this was done very recently, and uh, we haven't done a cost estimate uh, for this yet. But there is, we have been doing a lot of re-architecturing, and uh, this is a very small part that we have been doing. And uh, there are a lot of other things that uh, I could maybe talk offline and we can uh, discuss over. Thank you. So I think these two are the only things available, Image Magic and Boto3. Boto3 is Amazon's uh, uh, AWS thing. And Image Magic is the command line tool that you can run to do a lot of image uh, things. But the way uh, I was previously, before I saw the Image Magic uh, available thing, I was trying to build a PIL pillow into the directory itself. And there was a Amazon documentation page which said, uh, all you have to do is create a virtual environment, do pip install, and then you, uh, while creating a zip file, you keep adding the lib uh, site packages, uh, lib slash site packages, and lib64 dot slash site packages. So lib64 slash site packages would have the SO files, which are the C compiled uh, files, and as long as you have those files, it seem, uh, seems to work. It seems. So I haven't tried that part. Once I found out that image magic is bundled, uh, I didn't worry about that too much. Apart from that, is there a retry mechanism in Lambda so that if your function gets terminated or not complete? Uh, no, there's no no retrying or uh, things like that because then people will have long running Lambdas, right? So as soon as the five minute period is over, then the next, uh, it will again spawn another Lambda and so on. So Amazon would probably wouldn't do such a feature. That's uh, it's it's price and availability for a yeah. certain product and somehow the request is terminated early. Mm -hmm. You just, you just don't. Yeah, we have to live with that. Okay. That's the disadvantage. Yeah. But since we have five minute time, right? 
uh, and read is like uh, pretty fast you uh, have, you don't have to worry about this yeah. what is the infrastructure build around error handling for the amazon challenge so yeah errors uh, if error. there is any error you can uh, put debug equals true and it will just return the trace back itself as a, a json but you can also print all the you can print trace back dot ex uh, format exe and it will be logged to your cloud watch and you can view that later so that's one way you can handle so there is a scope for uh, like sanitary or sorry uh, python based uh, i forgot the name okay sentry yeah yeah sentry i think um, sentry is just plain python right so i think you can bundle it in your zip file and you should be able to post to a sentry uh, server so that should be possible because uh, the client which posts to the sentry server is plain python it is mostly doing a rest call so it should be possible and i think sentry would be a nice project to port into lambda because uh, you just have to whenever an exception occurs you have to log it right so i, I think that it looks like a sentry would be a nice uh, open source port that you can maybe try any more questions Maybe we can take it offline. So, yeah, great. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Sir Yuvansan. Uh, one announcement for the volunteers: please get together at Audi One. PyCon volunteers.